I'm in black and white this week because I'm depressed. Life is hopeless, death is a constant. All action is futile. Wherever you go, you can't be certain you're not just going nowhere. This is nihilism. To believe in nothing is to be a nihilist. To see futility clearly. Nihilism is the really big ism of the 20th century. An ism we still feel very close to in the 21st. And its roots go back 200 years to romanticism. The emptiness of existence. Don't try to fill it with comforting illusions. The German philosopher Nietzsche said Christianity, which was the heart of civilization, was only a weakness. It was a mistake. Christian morality is slave morality. Don't go there, he said. More than ever before, we accept life's futility, that it ends in death. There's nothing on earth we can do about it. There's nobody up there to save us. When Nietzsche said God is dead, it put the fear of God into everyone. He saw a man in the street in Turin beating a horse and it drove him mad. He collapsed insane. And he stayed that way for ten years. He died, still dribbling. But before he went, Nietzsche thought he was God, or Zarathustra, or Dionysus, or someone terrible. Fear of darkness and the void, that nothing but the void exists beneath this veil of illusions, was a romantic preoccupation a long time before Nietzsche. With Nietzsche, the fear just took a peculiarly vivid and egomaniacal form. Egomania is never far behind this particular train of thought. It goes hand in hand with the notion that apocalypse is just around the corner. Every age has its own apocalypse fantasy. What's ours? Here it comes now. Face down, ass up. Bitches and hoes. 1990, motherfucking one. You ain't back in this motherfucker, yo. Taking out all the commercialized The big selling sound of gangster rap. It's bought by kids, the language is utterly bleak and despairing. Its message is, now we will be negative. Not listen with mother, but listen with a different kind of mother. This is a track from the album Niggers for Life by NWA, Niggers with Attitude. Them in Compton, me in Brixton, what unites us? The fact that we both know it's an act. It's a stance, a playful fantasy. What is real is the desire to creatively and playfully get under the skin of the ruling side of society and its truisms, such as the law is fair. No, rub like crazy, kill cops. But also present a nihilistic blank where any morality should be. Be homophobic, anti-Semitic, and be bad to bitches. Treat them like, well, animals. These streets will never be safe. Get under the skin of Christians and evangelists and extremists who are all on the opposite side to you if you're a gangster. Gangster rap is not real life. It's a stylized version of it. It's minimal, pure, pared down and funny. We love its contempt. It's the end of civilization. Gangsters are us. A pile of dead guys. Not in Compton, but in Paris. It's civilization in the Romantic period, picturing its own ruin seeing the rottenness within itself. This is Jericho's Raft of the Medusa, which he painted in the early part of the 19th century, and which is now in the Louvre in Paris. It caused a scandal when it was first shown, not because of the male nudity, but because of the abject nature of the male nudity. It was considered to be utterly tasteless, a kind of monument to despair. It was based on a scene that really happened. The Medusa shipwrecked 150 of the sailors floating for a month on a small raft. At the end of that time, only 15 were found to be still alive. The rest had drowned or died of hunger or thirst, and some of the corpses had even been partially eaten. The romantic meaning of the painting, a meaning which appeals to our own contemporary lost souls, is of civilization adrift at sea, cut off from its moorings, the storms coming down, darkness coming down. Jericho painted the Raft of the Medusa in 1819. It was the height of doomy romanticism. Fifty years later, a teenager from the French countryside turned up on these streets. He had an incredible mastery of French poetic form, which was good. But 
He was an anarchist and effeminate, which were bad, the two most unacceptable things you could be at that time. This is a painting from the early 1870s by Fontaine Latour of a group of eight poets, six of whom are of no interest at all nowadays, but two of whom have a lot of electricity connected to their name, especially when their names are spoken in conjunction with each other, and that is uh, Paul Verlaine and Arthur Rambo. It's a very innocent portrayal of Rambo, who, although he was only 17 at the time, was known in poetic circles, circles like this, for the absolute vileness of his behaviour. Most of the figures in this painting didn't, in fact, want to be shown with Rambo, and one of them had to be replaced at the last moment for the sake of the composition with this flower still life. Rambo, in the early 1870s, was homosexual, he was always swearing, only weeks before this painting was begun, he was at an evening after dinner poetry reading, calling out, Mered, Mered, throughout the whole event. A photographer tried to stop him, and Rambo hit him with a stick. He was always smelly, he was a pet, he was an enfant terrible genius, he was a nonconformist. His poems are full of beautiful descriptions, often of arseholes and spunk. He seduced Paul Verlaine away from his wife and newly born son, and made Verlaine's life go all topsy-turvy. A newspaper article of the time reads, among the well-known writers in the opening night audience was Paul Verlaine, arm in arm, with a charming young person, a certain Miss Rambo. Here's a fantastic photo of Rambo, taken by the very photographer he later attacked at that poetry reading. It's become an icon, not just of rebel youth, but of something really extreme and violent. Corrupting Verlaine, a respectable poet, was to trash the high calling of art. One day Verlaine shot Rambo in the arm and got sent to jail. The final straw had come, and Verlaine arrived home with the supper, and Rambo said, if you only knew what a, and I can't say this word on TV, you look like with that herring in your hand. It was his cult of disgust. Society and art are not just boring, but really foul. And the only response was to give it back some of your own poison. He wrote parodies of the works of any poets unlucky enough to be held in high esteem by society. He turned their high-minded, slightly sweet sentiments into obscenity. Here's one now about Venus, the goddess of beauty. Out of what seems a coffin made of tin, a head protrudes, a woman's dark with grease. Out of a bathtub, slowly, then a fat face with ill-concealed defects upon the skin. Then streaked and grey, a neck, a shoulder blade, a back irregular with indentations. Then round loins emerge and slowly rise. The fat beneath the skin seems made of lead. The spine is somewhat reddish. Then a smell, strangely horrible. We notice, above all, some microscopic blemishes in front. Horribly beautiful. A title, Clara Venus. Then the huge bulk heaves and with a grunt, she bends and shows the ulcer on her anus. A little bar, a sunny street, a chablis of dazzling complexity, a few lines of poetry, what could be better? On the other hand, why not systematically seek out whatever is base and vile and think about that instead? That was Rambo's idea in the 1870s. He had to be a poet, he felt, but he had to be a cynic as well. It's a mindset that interests some modern artists of today, who are just about to come up now. Think of any painting by Hieronymus Bosch. Now superimpose a serving house, through which you can see old men in a cat like islands, corned beef spectacles and dolphins, catapulted from a misspelt youth, mixed in with the running clear gravy of old age, and arthritis of expectation slopped over. These artists are Colin Lowe and Roddy Thompson. This poem about modern life as a greasy calf of horrors is on glass. It's a work of art, but they can see through it, so can you. It's partly a parody of the poetic, grungy tradition that goes back to Rambo, and it's partly real. Eggless nanas study the cosmos, nectaring coloured E.T. hair, rolling out philosophical platitudes, like there's no tomorrow, and crocheted stroke cards. The I am as good as you, bad. 365 day a week, HGV positive, inarticulated good vehicle driver. 
tawny hay of a lifetime is hung by a behind her. Cheap, whiskey face bumping off curiosity with a crack of the whip. Closes the gap between the desire and the cotton king. Slides of Colin Lowe and Roddy Thompson's installations and artworks over the years show their knowingness about art. Fuck off, Brock, it says up there, but also a desire to get somewhere that art hasn't been before. Take the same journey part of the way, but don't let it be on a ship of fools. Maybe even take the risk of seeming to be a bit amateurish. This is their balsa wood version of Jericho. The original was a powerful pyramid structure, a magnificent showing off to the Academy combined with the basest horrors of real existence, with no redemption, the depths but also the heights. I think it parodies the grandeur of that painting in, in, a, in a nice way. Well, it certainly it parodies it by it. bringing it down to oh. such a small size and I making mean, it a little model. All we're trying to do is, is make an amateurly dramatic version of that, <laughs> you know. I mean, there is great disasters at sea, but there's no great paintings about disasters at sea anymore, you know. It's no do you know what I mean? It's just a bit like fear and dread and drowning. It's not really... Uh, and cannibalism. And cannibalism, <laughs> which all still goes on, of course, yeah, yeah. Packing cases of their own artworks instead of dead sailors. Jericho is about the knife edge between being and blackness. Here is a report home from the art front today between being and buying. Be creative, but only if Saatchi patronises you. <laughs> It costs 350 quid in an edition of 10. There's one now going to a watery grave. And down to hell go the ladies, ladies to Hades. And right in the back, stabs the knife. Oh dear, what a build-up of despair, a coffin of it. There's definitely a melancholy side to nihilism. It can be unnerving to anyone naturally cheerful. Do you think your work is, is miserable? I, I think it's got a kind of hopeless, inbuilt sort of sense of self-depreciation that that's kind of quite life-affirming in the end. I don't think there's one spectacular emotion about what we do at all. Yeah. I think there is a sense of sadness and there is a sense of pessimism and there maybe is a sense of nostalgia. There's the last one going up in flames. They've diagrammed their own despair and now they're going to be charcoal. Jericho based his painting partly on interrogations and survivors had a reportage element, new to art, in 1819. These artists want to be the describers of damnation and the damned. Themselves and their art smoked before even being launched. Nihilism is there equally in avant-garde culture and pop culture all the time. But if you ever get in a room with these nihilists, remember, nihilism rejects everything, even its own definition. Have you ever discussed nihilism? No. Thought, you've never thought that nihilism is no. particularly a being? No. I think that was worth 350 quid. What started as a scribble took five years.